Thanks, Rev. Glad to be here, Rev. J Jason, there's still so much we don't know about this story. Why do you think Speaker Bain is standing by Scalise today? Because the Republicans don't care. <laughs> because they can say bad things about women. They can say bad things about gays. They can say bad things about black people. And they keep winning Congress. So they have no electoral consequences for supporting people with this kind of behavior. It's clear Steve Scalise is lying. He, he knew where he was. He's not fooling anybody. But the Republican Party won't suffer any consequences for it. So Boehner will have his back, and they'll still give Obama a lot of trouble in the next two years. Now, being clear, Michelle, we're not talking about all Republicans. We're talking about one guy but he is the third top ranking guy in Congress and many people make mistakes all of us have said things we didn't do but we're talking about a pattern here that's a little more than we thought uh, when we first heard this from a blogger yesterday for example 1999 a newspaper talked about then state lawmaker Steve Scalise about du David Duke possibly running for Congress quote State Representative Steve Scalise said he embraces many of the same conservative views as Duke, but is far more viable. Scalise said, quote, Duke has proven that he can't get elected, and that's the first and most important thing. And that same year, Michelle, Scalise was one of just three Louisiana lawmakers to vote against making Martin Luther King Day a state holiday in Louisiana. He voted against it again in 2004. So does Scalise need to provide a fuller explanation for his past, including voting against state holiday for Martin Luther King, including he didn't attack David Duke's uh, parent racism, but that he just said, well, I'm a more viable candidate than him. He can't win. I can win. I mean, this I starts to build up a little pattern here. I am certain that the Democrats are going to come at him and want to have a little bit more explanation. I think what's going to save him is we are talking about events that happened 12, 13, 14 years ago. And, you know, to be honest, Louisiana back then, that's not so far away from when David Duke was a Republican candidate for statewide right. office. I mean, this is, this is a state where race was a, a very tricky issue and you had to kind of play in those dangerous waters. And I think probably what the congressman would say is that he has matured since then, and I think that that's probably kind of what the party line is going to be, that he learned well, his Jason, lesson or isn't, whatever. Isn't that uh, more <laughs> acceptable uh, to say I matured than to say I didn't know where I was going? Yeah, the problem that the, with this for me is that he's lying. Look, David Duke got half of the white vote in Louisiana when he ran. You can't run as a Republican in the state of Louisiana. Ask Mary Landrew unless you can appeal to a certain segment of the population that happens to be racist. And I'm tired of these Republican candidates coming out and saying, oh, I didn't know, I didn't know. It's, it's like the guy who gets caught coming out of the strip club saying, oh, I thought it was the DMV. We know where you were. Just be honest about it and move forward. And, and that that's the real problem here. He knew what he was doing. Now, Michelle, David Duke told the Washington Post that his political advisor was friendly with Scalise. Quote, Scalise would communicate a lot with my campaign manager, Kenny Knight. That is why he was invited and why he would, uh, why he would come. Kenny knew Scalise. Scalise knew Kenny. They were friendly. At the very least, does this raise questions about Scalise's judgment that he was friends with a white supremacist? Uh, I think this probably should just remind people of what politics in Louisiana were like, you know, as, as right. recently as then. I mean, David Duke was actually fairly prominent in the party for longer than a lot of people remember. You know, he had party chairmanship issues, you know, like in county seats and stuff like that. So, I, you know, you had to kind of be aware of who he was, and you had to handle him carefully if you were a state politician back then no, in the Republican I, I, Party. I get that, Jason, and that's the reality of politics. But then right. do you then make this person the third highest ranking member of your party in the Congress and say you're trying to reach out and you have an autopsy done and you are uh, the, the chair of the party and say now we want to be more diverse and you roll him out right. to talk about diversity. I mean, fine, people have their past, but you can't use him if you're trying to reach out and if he's not even going to say, yes, I made mistakes and I've grown, oh, I didn't know where I was.
Well, yeah, Rev, you're exactly right. This shows how disingenuous the Republican Party is about this issue. And I'll be honest, you know, part of also the reason why Boehner probably doesn't want to go after Scalise is because this happens all the time. We had Trent Lott. We just had Rick Perry, who had a ranch called Inhead Ranch for 30 years and no one saw it. Boehner doesn't want to go after him because he realizes that you have a lot of other Republicans with that background. And until they clean up this issue, until the Republican Party says we're going to purge open racists and bigots, they'll never win another national election. They can keep winning Congress, but you can't win over the country if you keep fostering and pandering to bigots. And I think, Rochelle, again, we're talking about one uh, person here. We're talking about some of the party leadership, not all Republicans. But if Republicans are going to win an election, they're going to have to break out of the boundaries that they're in in terms of the demographics. And how do you reach out without being transparent, open about who you're dealing with, and having leadership that has the capacity of delivering that message? Well, this does put Scalise in a particularly tricky situation. I mean, the party is desperate to overcome its image as a bunch of cranky old white guys. And he's going to have to be very careful. I mean, maybe we'll look out and he'll decide that he has to try extra hard and they'll work on, you know, kind of overcoming these issues. But, you know, no question this puts a crimp in their current rebranding plan. You know, Jason, does Scalise need to hold a press conference and take on all the questions and end it once and for all? I mean, put it all out there, deal with it, and, uh, and, and admit if he made some errors in judgment and go on. I mean, yeah, does I mean, he need to stand up rather than hide behind Boehner or release just text statements or written statements? I mean, he could show up with, with Will Hurd, Mia Love, and Cedric Richmond. He could sing Kumbaya. He can sit down and do a Donald Sterling-type interview if he wants to. But the damage has already been done, because no matter what he says and no matter what policies he tries to promote once he's in his leadership position in a new Congress, the public still sees this as the Republicans not being able to police their own. The public still sees it as a Republican Party that, on the one hand, says we want diversity, but we don't want the ideology that goes along with that diversity. So. I don't think he can fix this problem, and I don't think he's going to step down from his position. I think also, Michelle, the issue here is, is, is not just race, and clearly that's the basis of it, but it's transparency and honest, uh, because like you said, it's a time ago. If he was honest and dealt with it, it, it may be different. But when people feel like you've done things that I don't like or that I'm uncomfortable with, and now you're also going to try to mislead me, I think that's a, a underlying issue here that a lot of people are saying, well, wait a minute now, you didn't know, and you voted against King Day, you didn't know, and you, this guy's your friend. Now it's one thing for me to say, look, uh, that's all in the past. It's another for you to tell me today something that I feel that you don't respect my intelligence. Look, in politics, we learn time and again, it's not the sin, it's the cover-up, and yet people constantly do things that then they don't come clean about until somebody catches them, and then they have to kind of hem and haw or backpedal or whatever. It's just always been that case. Jason Johnson, Michelle Cotto, thank you both for your time tonight. And Thanks. Happy New Thanks, Year. Reverend. Happy New Year. Coming up, new questions tonight about the wreckage of a, a, 